Look at that. Beautiful solder walls. So I finally received the tools to reball my iPhone 15. This is a phone that I split in a previous video. I didn't have the right tools to do it, but I still managed to split the sandwich. Although I don't know if I destroyed the phone. So with the tools I received today, I'm going to show you guys how to reball this back together and hopefully get it working. You know, we have the heat plate, the stencils, everything. So we'll go over all these tools in detail, but I will link to these down below in the video description. So if you want to start working on iPhone 15 sandwich boards, all the links to the tools you'll need to do these repairs are down below. Also make sure you guys are subscribing to the channel. If you like seeing these tool review videos, the repair tutorials, and if you need a repair, I also have those links down below. Go ahead and check out also the links to buy a t-shirt like this one and my locals community. Those are two great ways to support the channel as well. So let's go ahead and get started with these tool review videos and tutorials. So the first thing is the T20 I2C heater. This is a heat plate. This thing is interchangeable. So depending on whatever model you're working on, you're gonna need a heat plate that fits your board. So this is the 15 series and you insert it like that. Now I did notice they changed the little lip here on this metal plate. So it does require a little more force, but that also means it's pressing down on the, on the heating element below. So it should heat up better. Uh, this is the little box that came in. As you can see, it just telling you that you can swap out the different plates. And this is for the 15 series. If you know how to read Chinese, comment down below what that says. This is the iPhone 15 Pro Max. This comes from my unboxing video that I did a while ago now. And you can see, you know, in the US, we have this ugly 5G flex. Uh, we have that connector on the bottom, although that's international as well. And then the design is different. There's a NAND here instead of a SIM slot. So US models looks like this. There's a NAND here, 5G flex. But if you see here, it fits. It will essentially have room for the 5G flex. It has a pocket underneath for the connector. So the connector is pretty much in this hole right here. And it obviously will fit, you know, the NAND and all this. So no matter what model you have, either the US model or the international model, the board should fit in there. Now this is the 15 Pro Max. 15 Pro is the exact same shape. This is the iPhone 15. And this is gonna be uh, the same for the 15 Plus. So let's see how does this one, oh, this one will go like this. Beautiful. See, so this is how it would sit and it fits nicely. It's like a little pocket. It also has cutouts to make sure the connectors here do not get damaged. Like that. So essentially the phone will be like this. So this is the, the way you face it. You know, the, the L pointing this way. And then when you remove it, you remove this top plate here. So this is how you would split a sandwich and then also use this to reball it, not to reball it, but to solder it back on. So now we have a proper heating plate for this. The next thing is I have a standard stencil. This is from Ammo, Ammoe. I don't know how to say it. This is for the 15 series. So it has the A17 CPU. A17 and also A16 because if you don't know the 15 and 15 plus has the A16 the pro model has the A17 and it has all the little chips it has baseband it has Wi-Fi I don't know what these other chips are for oh probably NAND so there you go this this should have the most common stuff you ever run into and then here's the reballing jig now this one is just the alignment jig and the three stencils. It does require you to have a, a full kit that comes with that magnetic base. So when I bought this, I bought this with iPhone X to iPhone 13. And then separately, I bought the 14 of this. So it was just this pieces. And then the 15 also just got these pieces. Now these were, all these tools were provided by DIYFixTool.com. So check out the links down below to buy all these tools. They're a China supplier and they pretty much have everything you're ever gonna need. So the way this works is essentially this is a magnetic base, this is the alignment jig and the corners kind of catch each other here. Although it does kind of move a little bit. I did slightly modify this one. Let me try a different one. Now I do have multiple of these jigs because they're very handy. 
All right, so this one also kind of wiggles around. So it's probably, which is fine. I mean, eventually as you're working on these, it doesn't really matter if it wiggles a little bit. So the way this works is you put the board in here. How does this align? There it goes. See, so you put the board in the jig and then you find the matching stencil. This is the 15 Pro and Pro Max international version because you can see the SIM slot hole. This is the US model. You can see it's one solid piece. It looks very similar to an iPhone 11. And this is the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus. It's the exact same board for 15 and 15 Plus. And as you can see, you just line it up like that. And you can see how the holes line up with all the solder joints. Now, before we try reballing it, we do have to wick this board flat. So, um, you know, like I said, this is magnetic. So what happens is the board is also magnetically attached. So what you can do is lift this up. Now the board falls out. So just keep that in mind. Also, when you're doing these, you will need a special spatula. Now this one came with a different version of this tool. So I already had these in stock in hand, but you should be able to buy these manually. This is non-magnetic. So it doesn't get sucked in by the, you can see it just comes right off. If you use a metal tool, for example, like one of these, it's gonna get stuck to the magnet. So you need a non-magnetic one. So you can apply the paste without the magnet interfering with what you're trying to do. So the first thing we want to do is wick this flat. So let's put this in the heater. I'm gonna heat it up to about 100. So by default, this thing's at 200. So let's go down to, one, let's do 100, 105, whatever. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna flux all the pads. Now, I'm pretty sure I already ran my iron over all the pads. So essentially what I did was add my own um, solder on there so it's easier to wick. Also, um, highly recommend you check out the first video I did on this 15 where I split it. I do explain my technique on this. I don't recommend you only use bottom heat. Uh, I've had bad experience doing only bottom heat. So watch the video. Basically we put it at, I think it was like 200 or 180. And then we use hot air on the top to melt the solder enough to separate it. Cause what happens if you put too much bottom heat, you know, the CPU is right here. You don't want too much heat hitting that CPU because it's underfilled and you're going to get solder balls that will essentially disconnect the CPU from the board. And then you have to reball the CPU, which is not an easy task. But if you want to see a CPU reball, let me know down below in the comments. I will do one eventually. I do have a lot of videos in my queue that I got to make. So I've applied flux all over the board. So now let's go under the scope. All right. So we reached about 100 degrees on the heater and you can see the flux has melted. Essentially the goal was to get this flux to liquefy because then it makes it a lot easier to work with. And I'm going to add a little more flux where I left some out because I wasn't under scope. So I couldn't see exactly where I got all the flux. So one of my favorite wicks is this one here, Chemwick. So I will link to this one down below. It works really well, as you'll see here in a minute. I'm gonna turn on my fume extractor because it this does generate a ton of smoke and you don't wanna be breathing in all that smoke. So I'm using my Action T420D iron, a 210 handle and knife tip. We're gonna go through and wick this all flat. It's important to wick this flat if you want the best results for reballing, if you try to skip this step, you're gonna have uneven, you're not gonna have the stencil sitting flat, which is gonna cause the reball paste. But basically the whole technique gets kind of messed up if you don't do this. So make sure you guys are wicking this board flat. And as you can see, it's sucking up solder really well. So now that I've kind of used up some of the wick, you can see how it's like more silvery than the 
you know, goldish, brownish color, orange color. I snip it off, so now I have a, basically a new piece of wick. And then continue on this boring task of wicking. Boring but important. So as we're going along here in this video, I do want to hear it from you guys in the comments. What are you guys learning from these videos? What do you find helpful? I want to hear you guys' feedback. I want to make sure you guys are learning stuff from these videos and not just, I'm not just wasting my time. Nothing worse than spending all this time making a video and you guys aren't benefiting from it. Oh, so there's gonna be a downside from this heat plate. So when I push down here, it tends to wanna rotate like the board. See that? So that's a uh, bad design, I think. But I think we should be fine. We're just mindful that it's gonna do that. Just maybe don't put that much pressure downwards. And you have the little fingers from the heater to kind of hold it down if necessary. You know, these little things over here, you can bring them to the board, uh, do whatever you need them to do. Some extra hands, extra fingers. All right, make sure you get everything. I think, I think that's everything. Oops, what was that? Well, I didn't cause any new problems down there. So we'll just go ahead and pretend it never happened. And then I would highly recommend these little uh, orange foam swabs. They're not cotton, they're foam. So it doesn't leave any uh, lint behind or anything. A little bit of ISO. You just wipe off all the burnt flux that you just used. I do see some pads were missed. So we'll come back and wick those. well make sure you clean it really good you want the pads shiny and silver not dark gray also when you're doing this make sure the heater is not too hot if the board is too hot what's going to happen is you're going to get uh, burnt burnt up you're going to get like oxidation on the pads which is then going to ruin your revolving so I've burned through one of these. You can see how black this thing is. Here's another one. So. Now there is some flux inside. I believe that was from the last time I worked on it. So I'm trying to clean up some of that as well. Now these things do fall apart quick. So there's that. Now one tool I am missing from all this, all these sandwich uh, things is the sandwich jig. I don't have one. And it, there was none available at the time I asked for this. So we just have to reball this and hope that fixes the phone. You know, these 15, 14, 14 plus, 15, 15 plus, these are really weird layout, sandwich layouts. So you basically can't boot them without them being sandwiched together. On previous models, you can. Now I do have a full guide on which models can boot top board only and what needs to be done to get it to boot top board only now you see a little piece here 
So check it out. So here's a quick guide on which boards will boot top board only. Uh, will it boot? Will it have touch? Will it restart? Temp warning. So you can see here that 15 requires both layers to be connected for the board to boot. Uh, and then here it basically has the kind of unique circumstance for each model. So check that out. I will link to this repair wiki article down below. It's very handy, especially for data recovery and no power scenario. So looking at the board, it looks clean. Uh, there's no signs of solder walls from the first time I split it. Everything looks normal. All right, now we got to do the top board. So the top board was also prepped. Now using the heater is really helpful because it allows the solder to get warm and keep the board kind of basically warm so it could be easier to wick. But there's no top board plates or heaters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this heat plate as and try my best to just hold it in place like that. So you can see it kind of moves, but not really. Because if you try to do it without this, what's gonna happen is the board is gonna be moving around and you're not going to be able to easily wick this. So the heat makes spreading this flux really easy. Look at that. Which also helps prevent, you know, excess flux being used. And the, you know, the board being warm makes it really easy to wick. Now I have had uh, some luck not wicking the top board since this is the side we don't reball, but it's, I've had had a few cases where I did have issues. So for this purpose of this video, I'm going to just show you how to work the top board and it's up to you if you want to just run your iron over the top board and skip wicking it. That's a judgment you'll have to make for yourself. And then if you do start doing it that way and you have good luck, let me know down below in the comments. If you do it and it, if you don't have good luck, also let me know. Let's learn from each other. Uh, like hearing, you know, other techniques as well. So we'll get some wick, I mean some flux on all the pads. Now my wick is pretty much gone. So let's see. So I, I was just thinking right now, because the one hole is in that post. So I probably don't need this one here. And this one will hold it down. Now you do want to be careful not to put too much pressure with the little fingers because that can also, you know, bend the board while it's hot, which is not a good combination. And here you can see how easy it's wicking the pads. Now I'll come back to that middle part, show you guys kind of how I deal with that. Let's focus on the easy part first. If you go slow, then the heat will transfer much easier. Let's get a close up look of what I'm doing. Laying the iron flats, letting the heat transfer, and then rubbing both the iron and the wick. I'm basically moving them together on top of each other. Like that. See how there's some solder not being sucked up, so just Hold it a little longer, go a little slower, and it will eventually pick it up. You know, ground pads are a little tougher to wick because ground is very heavy in thermal mass. So in order for the, the heat to stay there and stay at that temperature without being like sucked away by the rest of the board, what happens is the heat dissipates because the board is basically, the ground is basically the whole board. So the heat, you put the heat there, but it's like spreading out. And that's what happens on the ground. So 
the heat doesn't concentrate there, it's not gonna get to the temperature you need and it's not going to wick away into your solder wick. So take a look at how thick this is. Very thick braid, it doesn't really fray out. Now it is expensive, that roll was like $30, but well worth it. And I've had it for several months now, so it's not like it's you know $30 every week. It's like $30 and that's me. I would say a good, I think I'm probably coming up on a year. Oh, this is moving. So this is where I'll have to, yeah. Let's see, let me move this back. Let me put this one here as well. So I put the hole back in the screw, screw hole. And I'll do the same thing we've been doing. Just be gentle, especially right here because it's kind of elevated. You want you don't want the board to bend. Let me add some flux. Also, the flux, like the reaction it's taking with the flux, kind of tells you if it's hot enough. So, I think the flux is not working here. When you see a bubble in the smoke, that's how you know it's reaching temp. All right, so now let's rotate the heater so I can reach the other part. And I'll come back to whatever's under the little fingers. come back to that. Okay, we're reaching the other finger. Now I'm curious, do you guys have a different technique for reballing sandwiches? And if you do, and you truly believe is the is better than this, then I do want to see a video of it. So make a video and see. We'll see what the audience thinks as far as what technique is better. All right, so we got some other parts we still got to wick. So this skinny part here, what I like to do is press down and then fold up and then go sideways. Being careful not to get, uh, touching the surrounding components. Okay, let's do that here as well because the screw post is in the way. So let me snip off a little bit. Let's see. What I'm gonna do is put the wick there, bend it up, and then slide sideways. So we can pick up that solder. All right, got most of that. Now there's a few pads in here. I'm gonna do the same thing. Although let me add a little more flux. Now this little piece here is not on the 14. It's only on the 15. I'm guessing on the bottom board you'll see it's like a little bridge. Probably for structural integrity. All right, I got that, I got that. Need a little bit more over here. Move this out of the way. Let's go in here. All right, so I'm gonna do a few passes here to get everything. Let 
Now my flux is running out here. And sometimes you can get away with leaving one or two pads as is if you are unable to pick it up. If the, the chance of you bumping something is greater than what one or two pads may mess up in your sandwich reball, then it might be worth just leaving it. You, know, you have to make a judgment call on that. All right, so those are a little funny looking, but I think I got majority of it, so I'm just gonna leave it. Uh, try to wick this here. Got this pad there. I can't get to this little inner part here. Uh, this is one of those where I, I could try. I might as well just leave it to avoid uh, causing any additional problems. All right, so now we have just this section left. Let me snip off a little more. Hopefully the flux is still good there so I could with this. Oh man, it looks uh, pretty gnarly. By the way, if you guys are watching this far, I hope uh, you're also paying attention because uh, you know, I link to everything, all the tools I can think of that I use in the video, in the video description. It takes me a long time to find you links for each one. A lot of these tools, you know, I bought years ago, so sometimes I have to go back and try to figure out where did I buy it or where can you buy it. And just in general, making videos are very time consuming, especially with the amount of work I have. It's a uh, not always the smartest thing to do is spend a few hours making a video versus preparing my customers' phones, but I don't know, there's something fun about making videos of this stuff. So if you guys appreciate that, me sacrificing part of the business so I can make these videos, make sure you guys are doing, at the very least, liking the video, subscribing to the channel, Checking out the links down below. Joining my locals community. It's only five bucks a month. It's uh, think of it like you're buying me a coffee once a month while you're using this information to make you hundreds, if not thousands, a month. And you know, I I don't ask for anything other than at least a like smashing a like button actually I don't even ask that much I often forget all right cool so I think this is all done and just like the last one we got to clean all this up you don't want this burnt flux all over the board because it does leave it looking nasty and it won't make a good solder connection if you have burnt flux. You know, the darker the flux, the more it's gonna take to clean it. So if you were like running your iron over the same spot multiple times and not cleaning it, you're basically building up burnt flux, which is not easy to clean after. So, You'll find a few spots here where it was like that, but I think I got got it all. All right, so there it is. You can see how clean and shiny everything is. One thing I like to do also is 
Once I clean as much, I soak the board ISO. Now someone just recently asked, like, isn't this alcohol gonna short circuit the board? And no, the is isopropyl alcohol, one, it evaporates really quick. Two, it uh, is not conductive. So it's not gonna short anything. Conductive means electricity flows, like a medium of where electricity flows. So uh, like a wire is conductive, it gets electricity from one end to the other. Uh, isopropyl alcohol, electricity cannot flow through it, so it's not conductive. As you can see, now if you do have some stuff stuck between the chips like this, what you can do is soak it and then try to blow it away. Like that. These are uh, disposable clean cloths, so get new ones. You know, after a certain amount of time, these are gonna get soaked with just dirt and flux and stuff, so make sure you guys are changing them out regularly. Also, like this flux is technically called no clean, but I've seen some boards when someone leaves a bunch of flux on there and you don't clean it, it like kind of eats away at the board and the components. So make sure you guys are cleaning it as best you can to avoid any warranty issues as well. Same for the bottom board. Essentially we're blowing the alcohol mixes with the flux and then it allows you to easily blow it away. It essentially softens it or makes it uh, not so sticky to the board. So, makes it easy to clean. Also clean the sides. It's a lot of flux over to the edges. Also on this one, you, know, you have the back side or the bottom side. Especially like a connector like this. You actually see the flux in there. You can see I'm blowing it away and it's not going away. You can see there's stuff in here. This is flux as well, this orange stuff. The toothbrush. And as you brush it, you're essentially getting it onto the clean cloth. Also, sometimes you have some stubborn flux. So you put a little bit of heat. Kind of soften it up a little bit. So you see I'm at 330. So just heat this up a little bit. Now the hard flux now turns into a liquid, which you can then drop ISO and try to blow it away as soon as possible. You can also uh, brush it. And now you can see the connector looks way better. Same for this one, although this one looks way cleaner. Oh, I do see some flux here. There we go. Now the sides look really ugly just because 
how much flux was needed to separate and how much heat. So that doesn't matter. As long as it boots, you know, you can technically clean it as well. But that's going to be a whole different project. I just clean it by hand. Essentially, ISO. And then trying to scrub off any flux that comes off. Like that, basically. As long as it's not sticky to the hands, then you're probably good. Yeah, this is all clean. Technically, you could also throw it in the ultrasonic cleaner. So there's that. But since I never use it, then I don't. Uh, I'm not going to do that. All right, so now let's reball this. Okay, so I'll put this in the jig. This one, we're not going to reball. This is just going to sit on top. And when it solders on, it's just going to fall on onto the solder pads. All right, so for actual reballing, you know, like I said, we're going to need one of these. So mine already has paste on there, so I got to clean that off. And the key to reballing sandwiches, especially with this method where we apply the paste and peel it off, the key is fresh paste each time. So what I'm going to do is on my trash can, I'm going to hold over it and scrape it off with my blade. So I don't know if I can show this, but essentially shave it off. So I have basically um, shaving it off like that. So I have a clean tool. Once you got most of it, get a clean cloth and get as much as you can off of there. And then this is the paste we're gonna use, the G-Long X solder paste. This is 158 Celsius as far as the melting points. You can see what it looks like in there. And additionally, I'm gonna use another spatula, which I actually need to clean. So same thing, I'm gonna shave the spatula tool into my trash bin, trash can, whatever you guys wanna call it. Now this clean cloth, after I add paste like this, uh, I'm going to throw it away just because you don't want to have a random specks of paste in here and then you use it to for something else and now you have a bunch of paste on your board. So once I finish all this, throw it away, grab a new one and we're going to use this for reballing as well. So this is a little clean cloth which I'll show you guys how that works. So the trick also, we need another clean cloth. Now this one's a little thicker. Uh, you could use a paper towel. Uh, this one is for this. So we're gonna scoop up some solder paste. Now what I like to do is over time, you know, this is rubbing up against the walls and the paste that's on the walls is a little drier than the paste in the middle. So what I'm gonna do is get a clean side of this and essentially press it down and kind of like if you're prepping dough, I guess. I don't know if this is how you prep dough, but you essentially press it down and essentially you're squeezing out the flux that's embedded in the paste. So the flux is the shiny watery stuff. Now you do need that in the paste. But the problem is brand new paste out of the bucket tends to be very watery and doesn't give you good results so you'll see you'll end up with a bunch of it on here but also we'll have some on here and it should be more like a matte color versus a shiny color you apply it to your tool that so now we basically transferred it from the black spatula tool to this non-magnetic tool and then this is how we reball this essentially just press it down into all the sides and then sweep across you want to get this pushed into all the little holes
like I said, you gotta use fresh paste each time. If you try to be lazy and not get new paste from your bucket of paste, it's not gonna come out as good, and then you're gonna have problems, and then you're gonna be saying, why isn't my reball working? So, as you're pushing it down, you come back and kind of scrape it up. And then you'll go find the spots where no paste is in. So if you see shiny silver pads, you didn't get any paste in there. Now this is something I do under the microscope, but so you guys can see better what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing there. But let's go under the microscope. So here you can see some pads were missed here. So press it down in there and then scrape away. And now it's filled in. Uh, let's see all the pads. Oh, there's some up here that I missed. Let me get them in there. Scrape it away. And then I do recommend do at least two passes of everything just so you're like sure that you got all the paste in there. And the magnetic base is what's keeping the stencil in place. And there's like the little alignment holes. Okay. All right, so essentially we did two passes. Push them into these little bridges between the two sides. And scrape it all flat. Now you don't have to make it perfectly clean because then we're gonna get the clean cloth. And this is gonna compact all the paste into, the, into its shape, which you'll see here when we peel off the stencil. So move your finger. You can see how much paste was picked up by the clean cloth. Now move your finger a little bit to the side and do a, one more round. You're pressing down hard over all the pads. This is gonna push the paste through the little squares or the little holes and form the solder balls uh, in a paste form. So. Now that we got it all prepped, this is the scary part, but the important part. So you can see there's like these little openings on both sides. What I like to do is hold my finger here and when I peel it back, it allows the, the stencil to curl backwards. Otherwise, if we just go like that, you could potentially lift the whole thing as well. So you gotta do quick, don't hesitate, do very deliberate, movement to peel this off. So grab the stencil and peel it off like that. And then take a look at the paste. You can see pretty much all the paste is where it needs to be. This is what you want it to look like. See every pad has some like little paste bubble, dry paste over every single pad. Now there's gonna be some bridging, which is fine. We can fix that in post, so to speak. So now that we got the paste everywhere, we're gonna use 330 Celsius and 25% air. And we're gonna start on one corner and just slowly heat the whole board. So just kind of go in little circles. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Beautiful solder walls. And this is what type of solder paste you'll get when you use new from the bucket each time. Try to. Like let's say whatever's left over on my tool, I try to use it tomorrow, is just not gonna be as clean as this. It's gonna be either too dry, so it's gonna lift up on the stencil, 
Or is it going to be too wet? Well, definitely not going to be too wet. But um, it's going to be too dry and it's not going to leave behind the nice paste in the pa on the pads. So I'm basically heating over the pads and just working my way. Look at that. We just go real slow. Now there are some people who say, "Oh, take this off and put it in the heat plate, so you can just uh, flow it in place with with the heater or the heat plate." Problem with that is it's too risky. You trying to lift this out of the jig and to put it on the heat plate, all while not touching the paste, is way more difficult than just using hot air. So, just do it here in the jig. That's what the jig is for. That's why the material is, the type of material it is, is heat resistant, so it's not gonna get damaged. Also, I like to do uh, once over, over all the pads to make sure they all float into place. They all, all the paste is formed. All right, so now we gotta remove the magnet. Now we can pop it off. You could use your finger underneath. Move this to the side. Now one thing I forgot to mention is you gotta clean your stencil while you can. Don't let this sit for a long time, otherwise it's gonna be way harder to clean after. So just strip ISO and you wanna scrub it. And look, look how much paste came off of the stencil from the underside. So that's the side that was touching the board. Same thing with this side. Get your clean cloth that's contaminated with paste. Use that as well. And we're gonna save this for future reballs where we need to wipe down the board or clean it like this. Uh, not use it for cleaning the board itself, but cleaning uh, the stencil, I guess, is a better wording. Key is do not cross contaminate. So I keep these, it has like paste on there on one side of my bench, and then the one that I use to clean flux that I rub on the actual board on a different side of my bench. That way I don't accidentally rub a bunch of paste on my board unintentionally. Another thing is I do like to clean this at least once. So while it's still kind of warm at 107, uh, it's a little bit of ISO and then just clean off any kind of excess debris and stuff. Sometimes there's like tiny little solder balls in between. So if you clean it, you can avoid any potential issues of bridging and stuff like that. So that's what I'm doing. The older your paste gets, the worse it gets as far as getting little tiny solder balls that just don't want to flow in with the rest of the crowd. So, if we just clean that off. And there you go. Now while it's still warm, again, we're gonna come in and add some flux. Now this is gonna be the flux that we're gonna use to solder the top board on. So just make sure you put enough coat every single pad. The top board is not going to have any flux. You, you want to put just enough so on the pads and avoid getting any to overflow to the board like I just did over there but maybe I'll see about cleaning it later. that. Alright, so all the pads are coated in flux, except these two over here. 
We're gonna lay the top board in place. Since it's still not hot enough to melt, doesn't really matter. Just throw it on there. And then you come in and try to align it. So you see the, right here, you can kind of see the bottom board. So you push the other side into place. Okay. So then you have to push the bottom board so it aligns with the top board. So this is, looks aligned. This does not look aligned. So right here on this top side. All right. Uh, looks pretty good to me. So now I'm gonna bump up the temperature to, let's do one, 190. Uh, looks a little bit misaligned there. But you know what? It's pretty close. I'd rather just leave it than bump it and then mess it up. So let, let's give it a minute or two to reach temp and then see what happens. All right, we're at 160 already. I'm trying to see if I see any flux bubbling. 170. There we go, you can see. Yeah, you can see the flux in there. Oh, did I just see the top board move into place? Now, if you know anything about soldering, you know uh, what's called surface tension, which is basically, you know, when the two liquid, when things are liquid, there's a certain amount of pull that the liquid does to other liquids and other things making contact with. So, what that translates to is you can do stuff like this, where you bump it gently, uh, very gentle. And it moves and it snaps back in. So I can't push that way, let's push this way. I'm literally holding my breath as I'm doing that. Now the sad part is this post is way too thick, so I had no room to like this board literally can't move much because it's gonna hit one one of the walls one of the sides of the circle so uh if i had a suggestion for i2c is make these a little skinnier so we have a little more room to play with like this one you can see there's way more room you now if we bump yeah see that little bounce and 190 is a pretty good temperature for uh, the solder melting that we use. So I've now turned on the fan. This heater does have a fan as well. All right, so it's been cooling down for maybe two, three minutes. This does cool down the board really fast compared to just letting the air temperature cool it down. So when it's around 90 or so, basically under 100, the solder joints should all be solid. So it is safe to take it out you don't want to wait too long because also there's going to be flux that keeps it stuck to the heater. So use careful, be very careful when lifting this. There it goes. And it's a little hot. Also don't squeeze it. You know, even though, like I said, the solder joint should be solid, I still don't want to do that on purpose, we don't have to. Essentially what I'm doing is putting on this cold block so the block itself will suck the heat away from the board. Essentially these two are gonna try to reach equilibrium. Essentially this thing is extra hot, this thing is cold. So as they are making contact, they'll transfer. Well, it's more the heat is transferring down to the block and then it'll, they'll both eventually just reach room temperature. But this thing is already kind of uh, cool down. So we just give it a few more minutes. It'll be room temperature and then we can test the phone <laughs> to see if it actually worked. Now this is, like I said, I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll, we'll find out here in a second. So let's inspect the board from the side to see. Now this was the top plate. No, no, no. This is the bottom plate. This is the top plate. So we got to see the solder joints from 
the top plate and the bottom interposer. So that looks normal. It all looks like a typical sandwich. Now it's on the bottom side. It all kind of looks normal. There's a slight gap, but all the solder joints look like they're making contact. So I think this is good. So now the next step is to test with the DC power supply. All right, so this is gonna be a DC power supply. Now these are not available, stop asking me. Uh, you have to make your own or buy a different power supply. But this one, it just makes it real easy to show you guys uh, what it's doing. So I'm gonna turn it off. Now, one interesting thing I found out when doing the last video is this iPhone 15 uses the iPhone 12 plug. The connector is no longer the same as the 13, which is weird because the 15 Pro and Pro Max use the iPhone 13 plug. The 15 uses the iPhone 12 plug. The 14 uses the 13 plug. So there's, you know what? I, I'm actually, that's a good idea as far as what models use which plugs so I can make a repair wiki article on that. So uh, DC power supply, iPhone 12 plug. I'm gonna plug it in this direction, which I'm pretty sure that's the way you will plug this in. I'm gonna push power. All right, so no short. And I'm pretty sure the power button is gonna be on this side. At least it was on previous models. So I'm just gonna drag my tweezers across. Yep, prompt to boot is there. Now I gotta hold it on the, there it goes. That looks like normal boot consumption, which is a good sign. That means, oh. Yeah, I think I gotta put it in the housing so we could do more testing. All right, this is very exciting. Because honestly, I thought I killed this phone when I originally split it. So if you didn't know, iPhone 15 has the opening on the back. And then we gotta plug in the flex cables. Uh, let's see, it goes like that. So we gotta reach this Prox Flex. This is the flex we were cleaning earlier. Okay, you got that one. And then we gotta stretch out the display flex as well. Make it plug in, which is a nightmare, but it's doable. Hold on, let's see how I can, I gotta fit this in here. All right, yeah, it's gonna be a nightmare as far as a day-to-day -day repair. This is not easy to, now you could technically remove the screen as well, but that, even that, it's gonna be no fun. Let me make sure I don't rip the flex. I'm pretty sure this iPhone 15 screen is not gonna be cheap. Oh, did I reach? All right, so basically the flex cables are coming from the bottom of the housing up, so I can plug them in the display then I gotta move these flex cables oh man all right uh, uh, making progress knowing my luck I'm gonna trap a flex cable underneath and now I have to take everything out again All right, found the problem. The Prox Flex is sticking out way too much. I gotta fold it in underneath the board. Oh, 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 it felt, feels like it's... One thing about Apple phones is these Flex cables are basically perfectly, like the board and the Flex cables should all seamlessly kind of reach and plug in. If not, something is wrong as far as your alignment and stuff I notice anytime I feel like the board is not sitting flush in the housing it's probably something got caught underneath and it's not uh, and that's why it's uh, not sitting right all right all right all right All right, battery's in. Everything's plugged in. Now I do have 
some other stuff that's technically not plugged in. Now you guys, if you noticed, I'm probably, it's probably people yelling right now at the, at the video because I plugged in stuff after the battery, but they probably also don't know. Most things will not cause a problem when you plug them in with the battery plugged in when there's power on the board. All right, so let's take this off. Now my handy dandy USB-C meter is gonna tell us if it's charging. Five volts, one point something amps. Oh, two, nine volts. Apple logo, we have 10, so 8.9 volts and something amps equals the watts, which means charging boots. Now the key is, do we have a baseband issue? I don't believe so, because I should say no service. The Wi-Fi, the grayed out. So yeah, Wi-Fi is grayed out. Probably have to reflow it. Bluetooth is gonna spin forever. The cellular works. So we got that going for me. Now, because it's grayed out, that's not gonna work. Oh man. Yeah, so it's definitely having a sandwich issue causing Wi-Fi not to work, but I do have eSIM. Let's try to set that up. All right, so I've been messing with it a little bit, and one thing I noticed is also the rear camera doesn't work, although I think this might be just a connector issue because 0.5X works, which is not 1X. So there's that. Uh, because I don't have Wi-Fi, I don't believe I could set up the eSIM as well. I just tried it and it gave me an error. So it's not, uh, I guess that also kind of makes me realize that you're gonna need Wi-Fi working if you ever wanna reactivate a SIM card, eSIM, when an eSIM only. So if you ever have a, uh, like on previous models, there have been some cases where customers just want either Wi-Fi or cellular. So if you get one working, they'll be happy with that. You know, at least to get some use out of it when it's not, you're unable to fully fix it. eSIM, if you don't have, I guess if you don't have Wi-Fi, you also can't connect eSIM. So that's gonna be weird. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. But at least for this video, um, you guys saw the reball process. Unfortunately, I didn't get it fully working. And this is video, it's already gonna be long enough as it is. Typically this works, maybe not this time it is a new model and maybe i'll try reflowing it and get it working later but for now uh i do want to end the video here appreciate all you guys who stuck around here to the end let me know your guys' thoughts uh did i maybe bump something that caused wi-fi not to work uh did i mess up something else maybe it was when i originally split it that i messed up wi-fi remember wi-fi is on the top board inside the sandwich so i did use hot air from the top Maybe I floated it and that's why Wi-Fi isn't working. I have to mess with this further, but appreciate all you guys who stuck around here to the end. Make sure you guys are checking out all the links down below. Subscribe to the channel, smash the like button, uh, share this video with all your friends. And if you see any posts, someone asking how to reboss an iPhone 15, maybe send them this video. And also don't forget, support the channel, buy this t-shirt. I have some other designs there as well. Join my locals community and uh, watch the next video, which I'll link down below. I'll link to the other video where I split this sandwich. So thanks everyone. I'll see you guys in the next one.